Today on the Clean Power Hour, building integrated solar is the cat's meow. Danke schön. A new first for humanity in ground-based electric transportation. Can you guess what that is? Goats love solar, but of course. Tesla marches towards world domination of the EV market, and ballasted trackers are coming for your brownfield. You better watch out. Welcome to the Clean Power Hour. I'm Tim Montague, your co-host. I'd like to welcome the commercial solar guy and my co-host, John Weaver. Welcome to the show. Hey, Tim. How are you today? How's everything doing? I'm good. And we have a third guest today, which is a, a huge surprise and a great pleasure to welcome Tristan Arian Lorico of PVEL or PV Evolution Laboratories. Welcome to the show, Tristan. Hey, thanks for having me. You are the head of modules at PVEL, which means that you have a very busy life and a very dynamic <laughs> landscape. I was just saying in the pre-show that you know, a year ago, I was specifying 380 watt modules. Now I'm specifying a minimum of 440 watt modules and can, trying to convince my colleagues that we should be specifying 650 watt modules because Tr Trina and many other of the larger module makers are gonna be selling 650 plus watt modules next year. What's the scoop? Well, we're, we're seeing these uh, rapid rise to larger wafers, larger modules with, with more cells. And, and that's made you know, power classes just leapfrog from, from what we were seeing in previous years where there would be incremental improvements of, I don't know, two or three power classes per year. Um, you know, now we're seeing two or 300 watts per year by the looks of, of things. Uh, and there's a real arms race going on for, for additional power. And, um, and some of it is real, you know, we, we've seen manufacturers release uh, press releases and data sheets in the past where the modules take years to become commonplace and to be commercially available. And, mm -hmm. and we're seeing that, that development cycle really compressed as well, where we're getting modules in the lab that are, you know, 600 watts um, showing up for testing, which means, you know, these manufacturers are ready for prime time. It's not just a data sheet. It, there's an actual product behind it that's, that's ready to sell commercially. So you're seeing 600 watt modules. That's, that's, that's impressive. Um, is that the highest wattage that you've seen? Yeah, I, I think so. Probably, you know, from a few different suppliers, high 500s up to 600. Um, oh. I'm, I'm talking to manufacturers about going higher than that. But I, I think for the standard, um, well, I, I use that. Standard. Uh, yeah, I use that in quotes for the. Uh, you know, people are transitioning, manufacturers are transitioning to 182 millimeter wafers um, and, or to 210 millimeter wafers. And about, you know, high 500s, low 600s is, is kind of where that gets you in a 72 cell module. Um, and, you know, just for a history lesson, it, cells were 156 millimeters or six inches for years and then they went to 156.75 and that was you know an extra three quarters of a millimeter was shocking to the industry and that went to 158.75 and, and those were coming commonplace and then Longi announced their 166 millimeter and I guess when they did that that opened the floodgates and there was no longer uh, something that that the industry needed to follow. And that's how we got to 182 and, and 210s shortly after. So I've read that the 210 cell size is similar to the, the general um, global um, computer chip size of a wafer. So there's a logic there. And that computer chip size is actually growing soon. It may be turning into a larger size uh, wafer. So we may be left behind again, but it seems logical to go with the biggest cell uh, and some of the companies are saying it and then the other companies seem to be lining up where Longia is. And so I'm really wondering 
where it's going to come out at the end. I keep imagining that the size of the shipping container, like I saw in the one Jinko, um, yeah. they, they put out a really great document showing how they designed their unit and it fills up the entirety of the shipping container, the two pallets stacked. And it's like, it, it's, it fits like a glove and it's like that right there. If you can maximize yeah. the space in the shipping container, that's going to dictate some of your module sizing. And, you know, I, I don't know. I know there's other variables when they cut the cells three times, four times that drive the amperages and the voltages as you start str stringing them together. And, you know, Longy referenced that the uh, 180 size or the 180s millimeter unit was a very logical sizing for them to, to maximize things. Uh, I keep wanting to see one solar panel perfectly fit on the floor of a shipping container and just stack that up. That'd be like a 10 foot wide panel, 10 feet long. I don't know, something, some uber super, uh, super solar panel. Uh, I'm just, I'm really interested in watching how this plays out. I, uh, I, I saw a headline today that these larger modules, uh, they're lowering, they're thinning the glass in order to lower the weight to make them a little easier to move. But those modules that are in high hail regions are now going to be a little more susceptible to hail. So it's yeah. like trade-offs. And you guys get to break stuff in your lab. Yeah, we so do, for sure. In this? Yeah, so I think uh, you bring up some good points. You know, going to larger wafers increases the current. Uh, cutting those wafers into half or into thirds or into quarters decreases the current but raises the voltage. And, you know, there's all sorts of design considerations needed looking at how is that going to fit into the site electrically? Of course, there's mechanical, but also electrically, you know, if, if the module voltage becomes too high, then you're going to hit 1500 volts very quickly and you need more home runs, which is more copper on your site. And, and now maybe some of the advantages of a larger module get, get erased by having um, all of these extra home runs. Similarly, if you do the opposite and the, keep the current high, then you, know, you, you might exceed the current ratings of the available inverters or, or your conductors. And so, you know, and then as you said, the, the shipping um, considerations, if, you're, if these larger modules uh, fill up a container in a different way where you can't get a double stack or you can't put as, as many kilowatts into the container, now your shipping costs go through the roof. So there's all sorts of uh, different factors at play to, to find you know, that perfect size. And I'm sure there's module manufacturers that are will we'll send you all sorts of uh, documentation defending why theirs is the perfect size, but the industry certainly hasn't established um, what that is. And, and looking at, at the, the changes that are coming to, to the modules to keep the weight down, as you pointed out, thinner glass, uh, thinner frames, both of those you know, are, are good for a, a weight perspective, but can lead to um, less mechanical strength. And we have a test as part of our standard uh, product qualification program or PQP, uh, which we do on a lot of the commercially available modules going into the US market. Um, and that, that particular test looking at that is mecha the mechanical stress sequence or MSS. And we do different levels of mechanical loading followed by climate chamber exposures to see how susceptible the modules are to micro cracks and um, how much power loss comes from those those cracks and certain modules with, bigger modules me, are bigger modules more susceptible if you're wiggling stuff yeah theoretically they are but if if the manufacturers are are adding things to their design to mitigate from that you know i don't think we can paint all of all of the modules the same you know we yeah. we see that there's modules that perform quite well in that test and what could be considered identical modules where you look at both of them and, and they look the same. Um, it's not until you, you know, delve into the bomb details behind the scenes, but two identical modules can have, well, identical 
two very similar modules can have different results. And that's based on, you know, wafer thickness, um, encapsulant thickness, glass back sheet versus glass glass. Uh, the frame, you know, some of these modules have a centerpiece along the middle of, of the module for more mechanical stability uh, in the back. Others don't have that, um, you know, the, the frame thickness, the, the frame channel, like there's, there's lots of design aspects that go into these. They can affect that, that rigidity. Kristen, and, is there truly no industry association for the module manufacturers that where they come together and, and agree on some standards, because especially with the uh, advent of trackers, the, the bracket on a tracker is very short. Okay. Oh yeah. And, and, and so you have these huge wings of the module that are now unsupported. They're dangling. <laughs> and as the modules get longer, right. I just see this being a fiasco. Um, and uh, so I'm just curious, like who's 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 keeping an eye on this situation? Yeah, I saw in a um, in a webinar. I think it was hosted by Trina. There was like a 600 watt plus consortium of different module manufacturers, material suppliers, mm -hmm. uh, some test labs, mainly Chinese based, and. Um, maybe some independent engineers. I can't recall uh, exactly who was part of that group, um, but apparently they're all coming together to perhaps look at some of these aspects. Uh, we tried to participate in that and, and tried to get information on, you know, how can PVAL play a role because we certainly do a lot of testing and, and we see a lot of interesting results that I think a, a group like that could benefit from. And we weren't able to find, um, you know, anything official online or, or otherwise. So, you know, I, I think it, module manufacturing is extremely competitive and, and, you know, having a module still based on, let's say 182 millimeter wafers, but your, your module size is I don't know, three millimeters shorter than your competitor, I think they see that as a competitive advantage. And, um, and I think they would be, um, you know, not, not too eager to share their learnings with their competitors. So I, I don't think, you know, maybe that's a sign of immaturity in the, the solar industry and something that we'll get to decades from now. Uh, well, maybe not decades, hopefully years from now, but, you know, it would, I, I just joined a call about um, people looking to make a new connector standard where instead of like an MC4 and an Amphenol and MC4 compatible and all of these things, these companies will come together and make a new PV connector where no matter who you're buying it from, it's, it's intermatable. You know, you don't worry when you're plugging in your fridge if if you can plug that into the wall socket and if if your fridge plug is you know compatible with with your wall socket, they're they're looking to do that with with PV connectors. And I think you know a logical next step would be looking to do that with um, with frame sizing, module sizing, et cetera. Because right now, if, if, you're, if you design a site around a certain module size and module electrical ratings, and, and for whatever reason, you're not able to, to uh, go forward with that module selection, you basically have to redesign both electrically and mechanically. And, and that's an expensive Ooh. proposition. Yeah, this, yeah story I, like this, this story I have on screen shows this, uh, this alliance that you spoke of, and it includes inverter and tracker manufacturers. Yeah. So it's called the Open Innovation Ecological Alliance. Um, so I guess our, our readers and listeners will uh, have to check that out. Sorry, John. Yeah, I was, I was just saying that would absolutely stress me. Uh, the um, if you can't get the exact module that you designed for a year ago, 
just today we're designing a carport and we thought we were being aggressive by using a 440 watt bifacial panel. And I get on the phone with the carport guy. He goes, and we're like, yeah, we're delivery of late summer 21. And he goes, okay, you want to use the 500 watt? And I'm like, what do you, what do you mean 500? He goes, well, we got those spec from this company. I was like, 500. We were pushing 440. I've never spec a 500. I even thought it was something special to put in a 440. I've, yeah. uh, I'm installing some 425s right now. And I'm totally psyched that I got fought 250 KW on this roof with these 425s. And it's like, this is sweet. Um, I remember starting in the industry. I was in the upper 200s, lower 300s for commercial panels. Uh, when I first started in Resi, 200, 190s, you know, so now yeah. it's pretty cool to watch you. And, and I'm totally stressed with what you just said. If you design with one panel and you use a different manufacturer with a different spec, I, I really hope these folks uh, come up with like two big groups, like, you know, somebody based around the 180s and around the 210s. So at least we have some semblance of order on the larger sizing of things, or maybe they'll just be so much volume you know, 150, 200 gigawatts that it's the niches will be big enough that you can be covered. You know, maybe the, the biggest size module, there'll still be 10 gigs of it. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Um, and, you know, also pointing out years ago when, when you started and, and when I started and, and the cells were all 156 millimeters and your choice was mono or poly 60 cell or 72 cell even then module sizes ranged from one, one manufacturer to the next. Now it wasn't, it wasn't extreme, but you know, some, some would be 990 millimeters wide. Others were 995. And if you, if you had a warranty claim and those 990s weren't available anymore, you can't just swap in a 995 and have it fit in the same spot on, on the rack. So, you know, even then when, when it was a simpler bygone time, um, there was still, you know, a lack of standardization. On that note, uh, sadly, I have to run. But before I do, I'd like to to point out that um, all of our testing we we put we publish in our annual scorecard. Uh, the mm -hmm. next one comes out in May, 2021, but the data certainly in in the one we released in May 2020 is is definitely relevant. Uh, you can find that at pvel.com slash pv dash scorecard. And for people that want to get the data behind the scorecard, which is the really, you know, the nuts and bolts of it, um, that, oh, thank you. That data is available for free to the downstream. And, you know, contact me, contact uh, our contact us in the, the top corner there. We'll get you access to the NDA you have to sign to, to access that data and, and see how these modules are performing that you're considering for your projects. Tristan, appreciate it. You guys know so much stuff there. It's great to know that there's such serious people doing, you know, breaking panels for the rest of us so that we know what's going to happen in the real world. Cause you know, it's a 25 year sales pitch. We need, we need good data behind it. So thanks for your work. Yeah. Thanks Tristan. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's do it again. All right. Take care. Bye. So I just want to go on the record again as saying that I think a four by eight module is the way to go. Let's just stick with the building materials we know here in North America. I don't know what it is in Europe. It's something else. But North America is big enough. We can have a standard. Four by eight. That's a good, that's the same size as a chunk of plywood, right? Standard yeah. piece of plywood. Uh, plywood, sheetrock. And and how many pickup trucks, what percentage of pickup trucks can just take a, a perfect four by eight right in the bed? I don't know, but my cyber truck will, and that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> by the way. Uh, Thanks that for was, teeing that up. <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. Uh, also, I saw the image you shared of getting that 220 line put into your garage so you can uh, charge your Model Y. I'm, I'm a little envious of you. I, I don't have an electric connection at my place. Um, I, I plug into the standard plug and the electricity flickers at my place because it was built like in the 1920s. Uh, so, and then the <laughs> Tesla says, click, 
you're not going to charge here, buddy. Take it somewhere else. It takes about, and I only did it once and I looked it up online and they said, that means unstable energy. Don't do that. So I'm like, okay, well, uh, won't be charging at home. <laughs> John burns his house down while charging his Tesla. That's, that's, yeah, that's not a story we want to read about. No. no so crazy. yeah, you know, range anxiety is a real thing. And I've driven my, my model Y about 900 miles now I've had it for two weeks and which gave me huge appreciation for the supercharging network. Okay. Cause the mm -hmm. Tesla will hone in on that and help you find those chargers and they're vital because when you need to go 300 miles and your car will only go 300 miles, then you don't want to show up at your destination with zero battery. And uh, so I stopped, I went to Carbondale and I uh, photographed a utility scale solar project, which we're going to see later on. Um, it's called the Prairie State Solar Farm, not to be confused with Prairie Solar here in Champaign County. But, um, you know, you can charge, uh, well, when I was at two thirds or when I was at one third, I could charge to full in 30 minutes at the supercharger, which is eight and a half hours of charging on a level two charger, which, which is what I have in my garage now, um, which charges at 220 and 50 amps. So yeah, most people will want to get that 50 amp charger. I, uh, I say skip the fancy Tesla wall charger, which they charge you $600 for, but just get a 50 amp and it's called a 1450 outlet. It's a four prong outlet, right? Most, most outlets are three prong for 110. This is four prong because you're taking two 110s and putting them into a single plug, which is how you get the 220. So love that and um, love the Tesla though. I am surprised I haven't gotten a speeding ticket because um, it's so easy to, to go over the speed limit. And that is the other thing I commented last week, you know how it's a modern feeling, but it's also just like an easy feeling. The car doesn't seem to work to go fast. No, it's... and just to let you know, it can, it can not work for a lot of miles per hour uh, all the way past that speeding limit. So, you know, be very careful because <laughs> you can't take that car a lot faster than you think you are because of how smooth and quiet it is, at least for a person like me who had a V8, a uh, big giant 1999 uh, Crown Vic prior. So uh, it was, uh, you know, it's going from a beast, which was beautiful and smooth, to a car that actually has a slightly rougher ride because it's more of a sporty ride, tighter suspension, but that's absolutely yeah. silent. And yeah. it's just like swoosh, it just yes. drives. It's really nice. So you're in the Dan Aykroyd club. Did you know that? I have no idea what the Dan Aykroyd club is. Yeah, he's a huge fan of the uh, Crown Victoria. He has a couple of them. They're, they're used by uh, police, right? Or they used to be. Yes. Um, and... Um, and some so, people yeah. still use it. And in fact, they're used quite a bit. They're still used quite a bit. Yeah. You'll have to check out they're his great podcast. Cars. I'm giving it to my mom. He did a podcast with Joe Rogan. He talks about cars quite a bit. He's a car geek. He also believes in aliens, like aggressively, he, which is yeah, like, really awesome. Yes, he really believes in ghosts also. It was he a ghost. Claims, Maybe it's ghosts and not aliens. He lives on a farm that is haunted in Canada. By He's Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's right. All you right. got to believe All in right. ghosts if you're a Ghostbuster. <laughs> that's well, true. Good point. Um, I would love to just talk about Tesla all day, but we better get into the news because there's so much of it and so much good news. I really love this story you wrote on the DNVGL 2020 yeah. report. I'm going to share my screen. And is that your colleague, that photo there? Yeah, that's one of my projects. Um, that's Andrew. He's the lead on one of the commercial installation crews. He's got a lot of roofing experience. Uh, the photographer, that's Kat Knutes in production studios. She's a good friend of mine. She's actually an Oscar nominated uh, animation specialist. Uh, she was in a, a really amazing movie about Vincent Van Gogh where the paintings made up the movie. And, uh, and so she, you know, she took this picture of one of my projects. This is in uh, Pawtucket. We uh, were just finishing it. And I just really like that picture. Really nice picture. So 
Um, but so, uh, so that article, that article is about um, DNVGL, who Tristan's team used to work for. Uh, but DNVGL, it's, uh, you know, just a global analyst group. They, that's the movie, Loving Vincent. There it is. She, uh, yeah. She's one of the people that helped, uh, helped create it. And they were nominated for an Oscar. They won a Golden Globe, maybe. I don't follow those things a lot. And uh, so I got a photographer who's Oscar nominated for my solar projects. That's like the sweetest thing in the world. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so the report, the purpose of, you know, every once in a while, I like reading these reports that go out 30 years and try to predict the future. Because first off, they're all going to be wrong, but they're going to have some nuggets of truth. And you, you know, you pick the nuggets that you want. And so covering the report kind of gives me some perspective on what might be an opportunity that we have over the next couple of decades professionally. And so I really just wanted to get into the numbers and be like, okay, everybody, here's what DNVGL says, and here's how much capacity they see getting installed. And, you know, this report shows that we're going to get 10 terawatt or 10 terawatts of capacity. Globally, we have about 600, maybe 700 at the end of this year, gigawatts. So 0.7. So we need to go up by like 21 fold is what the report said. That's a lot of solar that's going to get installed. So from a career perspective, hey, I might have something to do for the next few decades. That's pretty nice. Um, and so they, they just go through it. They analyze. It's a really neat report. They look at each uh, region, North America, South America, Asia, uh, Europe, and they look at their power grids and say, okay, how can we tie together these power grids and model what they're going to use over the next few decades? And they build it out on a, they, they, they go through the logic in this report. They say, okay, first we start with an hourly basis. Then we look at energy generation and energy demand. And then we map it all out and we build it up from there. So it goes hourly, then weekly, then, then monthly, and, and we build this creature. And this is what our model suggests uh, would meet that and we can do technologically. And so you get all that dance at the end of it. They just, they have batteries for cars. They have long-term batteries. They have wind, they have solar. They see the, the, the largest source of global electricity being wind power. And I actually think that might be the case. Um, maybe, we'll see. Wind, wind or solar obviously was what I believe. So. It's a good document for looking forward and feeling warm and fuzzy about your career prospects. I really like the article. Yeah, it says that uh, 34% of our electricity will come from wind and 21% from solar PV. And then it lists gas fired at 20%, nuclear at eight, hydropower at 11. What I don't understand is where is the battery storage? And you do kind of touch on this in the article. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, it an, is it an oversight or an underestimate of theirs that they don't think that ESS is going to be a major player or what? Well, if you, I, I reference it in, and what I think it is, is that they believe the flexibility of gas is so significant. Actually, if you scroll up to one of the images right above it, um, they, uh, this talks about flexibility and the solutions from energy that they see coming from this flexibility and the gas has really amazing flexibility. Now, if you roll up to the next image up, uh, you're going to see, see that gray chunk that just goes up and down, up and down. There's a big wave. That's yeah. that super flexible gas. Well, right. that in my opinion is going to be wrong. I don't think we're going to need 20% of our energy from gas. There's actually a trivial amount of energy. You can just, uh, energy storage, you see it just after the solar disappears. These little tiny, tiny, tiny chunks of energy storage. It's like a few terawatt hours globally or 10 terawatt hours globally, which in my opinion is not, you know, we're going to have terra factories that can output a tera. We're going to have a terawatt of manufacturing capacity annually, maybe. We're not going to have 12 terawatts of global capacity. So my opinion is that that gas chunk is somehow going to be intermixed with more solar and more wind, and we're going to expand. And this flexibility chart that they think gas is the nirvana for, it's just what we have. Um, you know, I think they're a conservative group, and I think they're being overly conservative with the gas. And I think energy storage is going to pop much, much bigger than uh, they're suggesting in this document. 
So, and, so, and with that, that means we're going to have four, five, six times more solar, maybe two, three, four times more solar. So instead of 10 terawatts, maybe we'll have 30 terawatts, a little more, you know, job security. Yeah, so this one chart is primary energy consumption by source. And you see the gold band here is solar PV. The blue band is wind. And then there's a big gray band, which is natural gas. Coal is gone virtually. Oil is not, though. So oil and gas are not gone. And that is a disaster for climate change, probably, right? If this is reality yeah. and it's anybody's guess. And then overall, it's declining, right? Because we're electrifying transportation yep. and we're doing energy efficiency in buildings, yep. um, which is very important, right? We need megawatts, but yeah, I, uh, I, I'm a little depressed by this uh, and, and you point that out that this is depressing and um, somebody, somebody better wake up and, uh, and, you know, we do have a new administration coming into DC now. The Biden administration is taking the Green New Deal by the horns, and that's good news here in North America or in the United States. The question is, what's the rest of the world going to do? Not that we're necessarily the fastest adopters. We're 10 years behind Europe. We're 10 years behind China, even though China is still building coal plants. They're also going harder after solar and wind and things like high voltage DC. Mixed bag. A lot going on all over the place. So dealer's choice, what, uh, what story would you like to talk about next? Well, I kind of like, uh, we got number three on our list. This is just a real pretty one. We're not going to talk about it a lot. But that's a really pretty solar panel there, Bionics. And uh, I just really like their products in general. They, they make architectural solar panels. The uh, product uh, can actually uh, um, replace the glass of your structure. The efficiency levels aren't as high as a standard panel, but that's okay because one, they're bigger. Two, they have a different purpose. Uh, three, they're, they're architectural. So their, their goal is to be both a glass product and a solar panel. And they're beautiful. And they get put in really cool places with really interesting installs. And so every time I see Onyx pictures, I just like to share them because that's a blue solar panel. And, uh, and usually they pay back super fast because when you have a piece of glass that you have to put into the building anyway you subtract that from the cost of the solar panel. Uh, and essentially you end up with, you know, installation cost is zero because you had to install a piece of glass anyway and a little bit of wiring. And there's already wiring somewhere near that. So it's, um, I, I just like the product. I like architectural solar. And it kind of goes into the next story, this uh, BIPV uh, project that uh, we have a neat little picture of because that's, sort of kind of what this product is. This Onyx product is architectural. This municipal project that's in, uh, I believe in Germany, that whole building facade there, that's all solar panels. How cool is that? Your building is your solar panel. And this is the um, difference. This is the difference between Europe and the United States, John. You do not see this. You see a very tiny fraction of building integrated solar in the US. You don't see whole buildings coated in solar glass like this. Yeah. And so this is truly cutting edge and beautiful at the same time. And something that we absolutely can and must do to reduce the carbon footprint of our cities, right? Because we have built on 6% of the landscape already with roads and buildings. And we just need to turn a fraction of that into solar glass and we'll have all of our electricity needs met. So yeah, this is an amazing project. And I'm so glad that you found this story. So what, you know, one thing, you know, you're, we're, we just talked a little junk about uh, the U S solar innovation market. No, we don't have as many building integrated cool projects like that, but we do have Elon Musk who's turning literal roofing material into solar panels and that Tesla roof, in my opinion, is a pretty awesome product. And if it catches on, it might re-rate, rewrite the residential solar market. So if he can figure out how to scale that product, because it already looks like it costs the right number, 
if he can scale the manufacturing of it, I think that's going to be a pretty significant building integrated photovoltaic BIPV. Yeah, it's it's funny how my friends who are naysayers about Tesla still cling to, well, he's never going to be able to do that. Well, he's never going to be able to do that. They said that about the EV market, him disrupting Ford, GM and Chrysler, uh, which is clearly done. And he's even now disrupting some of the major companies like Toyota. I have owned five Toyotas. I love them. But Toyota does not have an EV offering. They have plug-in hybrids, which are pretty darn good. Their plug-in RAV4 is, is a damn good vehicle. It goes head-to-head -head with the Model Y, but it's not a pure EV. And they're asleep at the wheel. It's funny because I don't have the story, but um, it's, it's making the rounds that one of the executives at Toyota is bad-mouthing Tesla, claiming that, well, we're a real car company with real cooks in the kitchen and you better watch out Tesla. Well, guess what? You're late to the party by 10 years, Toyota. And yeah. Tesla is eating your lunch. Um, but now Tesla is gonna go after all these other segments like rooftop solar. They have both traditional solar panels and this roof tile that you mentioned. Now, many companies have tried to go after roof tile and failed yep. um, but that doesn't mean that elon musk cannot do it and certainly from an aesthetics perspective that roof tile if i could if i could put roof tile on my home i would do it in a heartbeat it is so darn good looking <laughs> and um, it is. so so yeah, yeah i think he's he's gonna figure that out whenever somebody uh says you know, Elon Musk, he can't figure this out. First off, uh, my first response in my head is, listen, John, the guy's not Jesus. He can't turn wine into water. It's not, or water into wine. It's not his thing. But my immediate response is to go Google uh, two rockets landing vertically. And you just see two rockets landing at the exact same time. And you can say all you want about whether or not Elon Musk can do this or do that. But he landed two rockets vertically and at the same time, and he keeps doing it. All he does is land rockets vertically. So that right there, whenever somebody says the guy can't build a thing, I just don't believe him because he landed two rockets vertically. And uh, that's really the end of the argument for me. So, so there you go. That's, he landed two rockets, Tim. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think everybody needs to be reminded of that, Tim. Tim, he landed two rockets. Yeah, sorry, I can't find the video, but uh, the, um, yes, so rooftop solar is not rocket science. And um, so the thing that I was arguing with, with a friend recently about is HVAC. There's a lot of uh, pundits who claim that Tesla is going to go after the HVAC industry. They've invented their own heat pump for the Model Y. Um, I believe I have one in my car. I'm not 100% certain it's a 2021 Yep. Yep. We both do. We both do. Yeah. So by, the, there... by the way, I want to tell you, you mentioned earlier that you put 900 miles on your car. I'm, uh, I'm about a month and two weeks into it and I'm gaining on 4,300 miles. Wow. I had a few trips pent up that weren't going to be taken until my car was clean. So then I yeah. took them immediately. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of clean cars, you know, the next article I put on there, uh, for China, um, and yes. I thought it was a, a good one to follow up our prior couple of weeks of our talking about EVs because we saw Jersey talk about 100% EVs. And I think we even had California recently that we talked about. Yes, and, we did. You know, and this is, you know, the company or the company, China is the largest car market in the world. And what they're saying is that by the year 2035, which is only 15 years away, there won't be any gas cars being sold. That's, that's going to be a monumental shift. I mean, the, the volume of hardware that's going to have to be built, factories to serve 100% uh, of Chinese cars, it's probably 100 million cars a year. They're just going to have to have factories and factories and, and engineers left and right thinking about how to design electric cars. The learning curves 
that are going to come to us will just be massive. And there's going to be so many weird looking cars. I think EVs are going to let loose on what the structure of a car can be because you can have batteries as the structure of the car. You don't have to have this giant engine up front and, uh, it's just going to be a fundamentally different thing. I think cars are just going to be different than how we look at them. They may still have four wheels to keep balance, but maybe not. Maybe they'll only need one wheel. We'll have, all have giant segways or something. I don't know. I'm just, you know, <laughs> China's doing stuff, and I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, the uh, and it's the combination between the electrification and the autonomy that is is really the killer app because – one autonomous vehicle replaces five non-autonomous vehicles and truly humans are going to want transportation as a service we don't think too much about it now we think about it mostly when we're going out on a week on a weekend and we're planning to imbibe alcohol and we're going to take an uber because we don't want to get in trouble and so we do have transportation as a service in society called uber and lyft soon we're going to have tesla getting in that space probably with human drivers and then we will have full autonomy and and i don't i don't know when we're going to get the you know the new rollout of fsd full self-driving they've released a, a new beta and you see a lot of youtubers posting videos about this i did also want to comment that the old fsd that i have in in my model y it truly is a dumb ai it's it's only really good on the highway under certain conditions and it is awesome under those conditions yep. but it's not great around yep. town you know it's funny as you were talking about the fsd i just and youtube videos i just put one on there that i found uh on our document there and in that video that guy goes through like 10 20 minutes of of just local driving on the new beta uh and it's it's we're there. We're there. We, we, we may not have like pure 100%. We, you know, we may be nowhere near pure 100%. They call it level five autonomy, where the car can just go anywhere at any time on its own and not worry about anything. But, you know, from a practical standpoint, you know, first off, we may not need to be there. And secondly, you know, my car is already making me a better driver. The fact that my car drives 99% of the time correctly on the highway is better than me. You know, I'm, I'm half asleep, half awake. I'm, I'm going up to the mountains. I'm coming back from the mountains. My leg cramps up. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, driving on a highway. It's, you always got to work at it. You got to pay attention. Now this car keeps me within the lane and keeps me five car lengths from the car in front of me. That is improving my existence already. This thing that this guy's driving, that's a, um, you know, we're, we're, we're at the point where these cars are driving on their own for extended periods. You know, this is 10 plus minutes of just cruising around the neighborhood and that's not the highway. There's no highway in there. And I think that's pretty significant. I, I think we're a lot closer to doing something interesting than, uh, than we need or than we think. I mean, we're really, really doing some stuff. And, uh, and that video was just another step of it. I can't wait until I have my, uh, you know, yeah, it's just driving, driving through the rain, cruising around town. Just, yeah, just... I want that. I want that, and I want it badly. He's promised for so Christmas. You, I'm counting on it for you Christmas. Were, Elon. <laughs> What'd you say? You were the you were the reason that I, without a doubt, bought the full FSD. I was like saying, "Oh, should I do it? I should be responsible. I got a business." And then you're like, "You know, if you don't buy the FSD, that's a really dumb thing." And I was like, "Damn it, he's right." <laughs> so yeah, good job well i'm glad you did it yeah i i have no regrets there and and fsd by the way people is going up okay it's already gone up from eight to ten thousand dollars elon has gone on record saying it's going to be worth a hundred thousand dollars once it, once it's fully capable and they are going to charge accordingly so watch out folks and some pundits are and I'm among them, are seeing a day when Tesla won't be very motivated to sell cars to consumers, period. They've already said that if you lease a Tesla, you're not going to be able to buy it out because they're going to turn it into a robo-taxi and turn it into a cash machine. So yeah. you better get your orders in. Now, I'm building a fleet of seven Teslas, 
And that's going to be my retirement passive income. All right, if I could pull it off. Yeah. So there was a first in electric transportation this week. And it's something that has been stewing for a long time. Okay. And there's been a lot of hype and there's been a lot of, you know, just slow moving. But the Hyperloop, uh, Virgin Hyperloop, has now done a test with passengers riding in a Hyperloop tunnel at over 100 miles an hour. Uh, this happened two days ago. And I like this because Richard Branson is involved. Okay, he's a major investor. He, of course, has an airline, so he knows about this experience. He knows how to create a winning experience for customers getting into tubes and going at high speed across the earth. <laughs> Does it matter That's if it fine. has wings? Probably not. Um, it That's needs to be safe. It point. needs to be fun. And uh, it needs to be a pleasant but fast experience. And that is what they're promising here. You know, what, what I'm curious about is that Elon has gotten very quiet about Hyperloop. He, for, for a while, he was charging hard after Hyperloop. He seems to be more going after the boring company. Of course, they're compatible. One, you know, you can put Hyperloops underground just like you can put any old tunnel underground. A Hyperloop is just a tunnel that is depressurized so that the vehicle in it can go very fast with very little resistance. And of course that has its challenges because then you've created a vacuum tube. And if some if if there's a leak or a catastrophic leak, like a bullet hole, that creates a shock wave and there's a major self a safety issue there, um, which I'm not sure how they're dealing with that, but they're doing above ground tunnels in um, Las Vegas. So it's um, it's interesting technology. Yeah, I think uh the boring company hardware might be more about the boring portion of it, making these new versions of tunnel borers. And then I think the goal afterwards is Hyperloop to make use of these tunnels once they get uh, the practice of making them and go through stuff. And he and Elon is still working with various groups to do uh, Hyperloop type work. There's multiple Hyperloop organizations globally. Um, and, uh, and I do think it's funny, Branson putting people in a tube, shooting them places really fast. That's a good way of looking at it. But I will say he doesn't necessarily always win. You know, uh, he, he was one of the first with Virgin Galactic to be shooting people up in this, uh, attempting to shoot people up in the pace space. And his goal for many years has been to uh, uh, start that commercially for like quarter of a million dollars a shot. And it still hasn't happened. So Hopefully, uh, him making a pretty version does work because it, it would be all perfect white plasticky, plasticky, and look like it's from Space Odyssey 2001. But uh, and and maybe it'll be nice. But I want to see it happen. I'd like to see him make it happen. So is that the Prairie? Is that the Prairie plant? Yeah. So this is Prairie State Solar down in Southern Illinois, which I visited last weekend, and <clears throat> you can see in the distance right here there is a plume coming out of the Prairie State coal burning power plant, uh, which is just a few miles away, which is where they got the name for it. But um, this is a 99 megawatt. I think that's AC, but I'm not sure. I couldn't find the AC or DC stat, but it's it's built as a 99 megawatt solar farm developed by Ranger Power, Rangers from New York State. And it's being EPC'd by Swinnerton. And this is by far the largest solar project that I've ever laid eyes on. We see um, this is next tracker trackers, uh, and the torque tubes are on this segment of the project. There are some segments where they're still pounding posts, and it is solar as far as the eye can see. There you go. And Was this the old farmland? Yes. This is farm country. Yeah. And um, now this is Southern Illinois. This is also coal country, which is why there's so much coal in Illinois. Um, a funny aside is that my, my mom's father and father's father 
ran a publication called the Black Diamond, which is a coal trade magazine. And we still have lots of coal in Illinois. It's very dirty coal, high sulfur. So it's, it's not very desirable. Most of it, I think, goes overseas, honestly, unfortunately. But it is still being mined. And, um, but of course, you see here, there is farmland and uh, corn and beans. I'm told, and then, uh, I'm told that, I'm told that the soil, I got a good buddy of mine, Michael Lewis Gallant. He's a farming family from uh, Southern Illinois. And I'm told that uh, some of the best soil in the nation is, uh, is the black gold of the, uh, the farmland in Illinois. And uh, oh yeah, he says, you better come with a real good lease rate if you want to turn some of this land into solar. So he and I have been chatting about stuff. So it's, uh, it's cool. Cool that you're filming there. I'm going to tell him so, about it. So here in, uh, in Champaign County in central Illinois, this is the, the, the primest prime farm ground in the country. There's kind of a swatch that runs across central Illinois and it's on par with there. There's a few other places. There's some places in Russia where they have equivalent good, soil you know this was the prairie state 90 percent of illinois was tall grass prairie before the europeans settled it and it built up this very deep dark soil and uh, which was wonderful for cropping once they discovered the steel plow it took a steel plow to break the the root mat of the prairie and that was a major innovation in in its day i don't know what year that was but um so you mentioned prices and and that's the other thing that i love about solar you know is that it's such a win-win for the farmers also um a a solar farmer will pay 900 dollars an acre perhaps um i've heard rates as high as a thousand dollars and you can only get 300 dollars an acre for cash cropping. So you can triple your, your rent. And when you think about crop prices and the volatility of these commodities, they're highly volatile. So if you're a landowner and you're, and you're looking at these two options, do I continue to rent my land to somebody who's gonna farm it for beans and corn? Or do I talk to the solar farmers? You often are gonna talk to the solar farmers because it's guaranteed income for 20, 25 years guaranteed right and cropping is just not that there's 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 going to be some fluctuation up and down and so it actually provides some resiliency for these communities these communities are struggling to keep their their youth on the land right the youth want to go to the cities where the action is and these these economies while farming is still lucrative it is also subsidy dependent upwards of a third of the farmers incomes is coming from subsidies. And, and so it is actually an industry that's teetering on obsolescence. And we truly have to figure that out. There is going to be a radical transformation of farming in the next 50 years, in addition to our power grid. So kind of looking forward to seeing how we figure out, figure that out. There's a big crane going down that road. I wonder what they're going to do with that crane. I got two items, two items to throw on there. One is that uh, I looked it up. John Deere invented the steel plow, 1837 in Grand Detour, Illinois. Yes, I should know that. And, um, but that is why John Deere is such a big deal in Illinois, right? Because um, he was right here and he invented the future that that made Illinois so famous for farming. Okay. We're still riding on thing, those. I think we're going to do a lot of growing. Oh, sorry. I, I, was, I was about to say, I think we're going to do a lot of uh, farming indoors. I think we're going to have a lot more electricity in the future than we know what to do with. And that's going to make indoor vegetables, indoor, I don't know about fruits, but maybe we'll evolve and eat different fruits or something. I don't see trees inside shipping containers, but who knows? The future's long, longer than me. <laughs> yep. We have a, another Tesla story, John. Tesla receives massive new order of Tesla semi, semi trucks and Electrek is very, a very good source. If anybody doesn't know about Electrek, yep. check it out. 
they do awesome coverage of the EV industry. I'm not yeah, really I, into, I, uh, I'm not into semis, but I want one of these semi. too. <laughs> That's funny. I don't really like semis, but I want one of these. That's great. I, I really like the uh, semi thing because from everything I read, transportation, uh, huge, huge amounts of it is coming from the big trucks. And we're, we're getting a good handle on the smaller vehicles, uh, starting to at least, but now the trucks have to come. And it's really great to see that the economics of the truck will change uh, things so significantly, like not having to work on these vehicles, not having to, you know, pay for the gas, have random fuel, you know, paying for electricity differently. It's, it's really sweet. Uh, you know, Musk specifically said in his earnings call that the, yeah, check that out. I mean, imagine driving a truck with that view. You get perfect view all the way around you. And it's just one little thing up there, a couple of screens. It's going to be a totally different driving experience for truck drivers. Um, but uh, Musk said that the, the trucks are like five, 600 kW of, elect, of batteries. So like six, seven of your cars would ne be needed to fill that truck battery. And he said they just don't have the capacity yet. So, you know, the, tr this, these, the launch of these has been slowed down a bit. The Texas Gigafactory, the, one of the reasons it's so big is that they just want to make a massive amount of batteries that just go straight into trucks. Like they're just going to pump batteries just for trucks. That's going to be one of the major things going on at the D Texas Gigafactory because they just want to roll out some serious volume. And, you know, uh, another 22 to $100 million order, that ain't bad for Tesla. Whatever sales guy closed that deal, nice commission there, buddy. Good, good job. <laughs> yep, indeed. Um, so you put a line in the dock. I'm just checking in. Are we are we going to stop with this Giga Berlin story? I know we're we're coming That's to the end of our me. hour. Yeah, yeah, John Weaver. We got to run to a new site. Um, we we have a site visit with the GC, small residential or small commercial project. Um, we were doing, uh, we did the module install and a lot of stuff last week or yesterday on Friday, we put in the racking. Now I got to go hang out with an inspector and walk a site. So got to do some work. That's my favorite Excellent. part of the day. Yep. Love going on site and I'll be going on site hopefully later this week again on the couple of the community solar projects that we're building where the modules are now going up. We're reaching mechanical completion uh towards thanksgiving so looking forward to that on three different community solar projects this is giga berlin we're just leaving you with a few drone shots of giga berlin it is starting to look like a factory here going to be making the european version of the model y with those huge stamped parts and and structural um, batteries and structural batteries which i'm so curious how that plays out for battery recycling which is going to be a huge thing um, but maybe they'll just keep it in its form and then pass it on to stationary storage there's a story that we're that, we're, that i haven't read that you found about stationary storage and repurposing these ev batteries mm -hmm. so wow man it's gonna be a huge facility beautiful facility it takes the breath away. And, uh, you know, what most people don't realize is Tesla is just getting started. So many people are convinced that they're one and done. And yeah, they've been at it for 10 years, but they're not done. They're just getting started. And, um, and Elon is going to fuel SpaceX with his earnings from Tesla. So he sees Tesla as, as one of the engines for SpaceX. And SpaceX is the parachute for humanity to give us a backup plan in the event of a catastrophic meteor or catastrophic climate change or catastrophic AI explosion. All of the above, maybe at the same the time. Above. I tell my children, be prepared for all. Yes. Okay, John. Well, how can our listeners reach you the commercial solar guy 
Well, they can type that phrase right there into the interwebs and it will find me. Uh, our website, commercialsolarguy.com. I try to put out two or three articles a week. Uh, on Twitter, I post way, way too much stuff, uh, way too much. Uh, but it's always good, good data regarding solar, pictures of my projects. Um, and uh, you can find us anywhere. Commercialsolarguy.com is really the best way. And that'll get you to us. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have monthly pre-announced pre-registered events. This is the PV inverter and battery storage scorecard with Michael Mills Price, also of PV Evolution Labs. That is next Tuesday. So just go to cesnrg.com forward slash podcast and you can register for that. It's free. Space is limited though. So check it out. Michael is a engineer and a PE. So he really knows his stuff and we're looking forward to breaking down that uh, those two scorecards. And then otherwise, just go to cesnrg.com forward slash videos for all of our other content, including the Clean Power Hour. And you can reach me at TG Montague on Twitter. So I think that's a wrap, John. Have a great week, Tim. Let's grow solar and storage. I'm Tim Montague. Take care.